Hello, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Exercise Rehabilitation and Sport Performance channel. This channel is for the healthcare movement professional looking to incorporate applied research concepts into their current practice setting. Today's topic, manipulating exercise tempo to increase motor output. The objectives of this discussion are to discuss the effects different tempo training protocols have on increasing a one repetition max and maximal voluntary isometric contraction strength. Compare different tempo training protocols on their ability to increase motor output. And to discuss the strategy of utilizing tempo training to enhance your patient client outcome measures. Today we'll be highlighting the reported outcomes by Sadiq et al, which examine the cortical spinal responses to three different strength training tempo protocols. In accordance to the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, this is a controlled experimental study and falls under the category of level two evidence. To summarize things, I've taken and extracted the programming components that were utilized in this study. So you'll see that we had 42 healthy novice strength training participants between the age range of 25 plus or minus six years, 22 of which were male, the other 20 were female. These individuals were randomized into one of four groups, a control group, a paced strength training group, a self-paced strength training group, an isometric strength training group. The activity that was performed was a dumbbell bicep curl. Tempo was manipulated for each one of the groups. For the self-paced group, it's ex exactly as it sounds. These individuals perform the exercise at their own self-pace, which on average took three seconds. For the paced strength training group, a guided metronome was utilized and each repetition was broken down into a three-second concentric time frame and four-second eccentric time frame. For the isometric group, these individuals performed a 7 second hold following 7 second rest while listening to the metronome as well. The dependent variables that were measured were motor evoked potentials and short interval intracortical inhibition. MEPs are commonly used as a measure to understand the execution and performance of a movement and or to quantify physiological change in cortical spinal excitability of the motor system. Short interval intracortical inhibition is measured as the relative amplitude reduction of a motor evoke potential. Intensity across all groups was 80%. Each group, in terms of sets and reps, performed four sets of six to eight reps with progressive overload. The rest for the exercise protocol involved three minutes of rest between sets and 48 hours between training sessions. And lastly, the duration included the individual report three times a week over the period of four weeks. Let's have a look here at study power, or it's sometimes written in articles, one minus beta. For this particular study, it was not reported. If you're not sure why you need to know this, let's take a brief minute to provide you a basic understanding as to why this is of importance to you, the consumer of research. Power could be verbalized as the following. If we repeatedly conducted this study over and over again, blank percentage of the time, it would result in the same findings that exist by those in the greater population. What researchers are attempting to do is to show how closely the sample studied represents the population at large. This allows for a greater generalization of the findings. Power can be affected by significance level, sample size, variability, and effect size. An acceptable study power is considered 0.8 or higher. This would indicate if we repeatedly conducted this study over and over again, 80% of the time it would result in the same findings that exist by those in the greater population. As a consumer of research, it's important to caution that just because a study has a lower reported power, it does not mean the interventions utilized are of no benefit. Quite often, clinicians disregard studies composed of a lower number of participants due to the fact it may lead to less generalization. 
What's important to ask yourself here is does the situation in which I want to apply the reported study outcome or outcomes to, does it call for generalization or individualization? In terms of strength increase, the self-paced and tempo-paced strength training groups were observed to be statistically significant training methods to increase a one repetition max in comparison to the isometric and control groups, whereas only the isometric training protocol proved to be statistically significant in improving measures of MVIC. These statistically significant p-values indicate that a mathematical difference exists between the two groups. Now let's examine the magnitude of this difference and what it means to us clinically. To understand the magnitude of this difference, let's have a look at our reported effect sizes. Across all three strength training groups, a very large effect size was observed. This indicates that greater than 81% of participants undergoing the self-paced and tempo-paced interventions would experience a different one rep max outcome as those in the isometric and control groups. It also indicates that greater than 81% of participants undergoing the isometric intervention would experience a different MVIC max outcome as those in the self-paced, tempo-paced, and control groups. Additionally, upon examination of the CIs, clinically, we could expect a patient or client from the same demographic to fall within the provided improvement ranges 95% of the time. The findings for increased corticospinal excitability and amplitude reduction indicate that a statistical significance was observed only in the tempo-paced group. Corticospinal excitability improved by 113% with a decrease in amplitude reduction of 60%. Let's have a look at what this means clinically. In order to apply our statistical results in more of a clinical fashion, let's go back to our associated effect sizes and confidence intervals. This table compares tempo pace training to all other groups. In terms of MEP increase, this indicates that 68% of participants undergoing the tempo paced training intervention would experience different MEP outcomes compared to those of the SPT group or the self-paced training group. Really what it comes down to is we're looking to see how different or the size of the difference between these groups. How many people between the groups would approximately kind of overlap in their scores. So the higher the non-overlap, the more different the groups are from each other. Additionally, the calculated 95% confidence intervals provide us with a range of MEP and SICI increases or decreases we could expect to see in the gen pop. And it's about that time again to start wrapping things up, but before we do, backed by popular demand, I got my man Little John to help me present today's clinical gems. John, I love the tie, man. What? I said I love your tie. Okay! How about we bust out some clinical gems for the folks at home? Yeah! Let's have a look at the evidence-based truths this article provides. First, excitability of the primary motor cortex is organized in a task-dependent manner. Different tempos result in different outcomes. Slower repetition speeds increase the precision required to maintain the specific timing of movement. This contributes to the strengthening of existing neural connections, formation of new connections, a decrease of the amplitude reduction of motor output, and overall greater levels of use-dependent plasticity. Let's talk application here. How are we going to implement these new strategies into our day-to-day -day practice? First, ask yourself, what can each of these tempos provide? We learned today that some tempos can provide greater efferent output and others can give us greater strength gains. Now in your programming, what can you use these tempos for? Maybe you want to add them to a warm-up routine or a cool down. Maybe you want to use them as part of your neuromuscular re-ed. You can stack them with other parameters. We've previously discussed 
eccentric programming. If we were to take tempo and stack it with eccentric programming, this could help us with earlier onset times, movement preparation, planning, and execution. Now lastly, a quick moment of reflection here. You got to make sure that you're having an understanding of what these new truths can and cannot give you. We've gone through that pretty thoroughly in this video. So make sure that you're just not randomly applying this to any of your clients or patients. Have a reason for doing it. Design with a purpose. In order to determine how effective utilizing this is for the individuals that we're working with, you need to have some kind of measurable outcome that helps you assess your clinical effectiveness. And then lastly, how is all this programming going to help you and your patient work towards the greater goals that you have designed for them? Here at the channel, we're dedicated to establish and foster a positive interprofessional environment in which learning can occur regardless of your profession and or previous training. Please help us spread the word to your healthcare movement colleagues looking to incorporate more evidence-based research application into their own practice. As always, if you like what you see, please subscribe and join our YouTube channel community, where the number one goal is improving the lives of those we serve. A big thanks for hanging out with us today. See you in the next video.